<laughs> so two signs, four responses. So let's take a look first before we get into that, into um, this. And you all may remember this if you live in New York or have lived in New York. This may look familiar to you. Let me just zoom in on a little bit there. Okay, for anyone who can name it quick. You win the prize. Um, it is <laughs> the, do we have any takers? I'm sure you know. It is 601 Le Lexington Avenue in New York City. And it is the, I don't see anyone weighing in, the City Corp building. <laughs> so this is a story about the City Corp building. Now, on a warm June day, in 1978, William Lemessure, one of the nation's leading structural engineers, received a phone call at his headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts, from an engineering student in New Jersey. Now, as a structural consultant to the architect, he had designed the 25,000 ton steel skeleton beneath the tower's aluminum skin. So he was the engineer that did this. At 52 years old, he had won his share of accolades for the tower's technical elegance and grace. And earlier that year, he had been elected to the National Academy of Engineering, the highest honor his profession bestows. So Lemassure asked his caller, uh, how could I help you? And the student, a young woman, again, just a student of engineering, had been assigned to write a paper on the new City Corp Tower when it was finished in 1977. It was the seventh tallest building in the world. Now you're remembering, right? You've all walked uh, by this. The student wondered about the four columns, which you can see, that held the building up. And according to the student's professor, Le Mesure had put them in the wrong place. Instead of being positioned at the corner, each of the nine-story columns had been placed at the center of each side. So this design allowed the architect and the engineer to kind of cantilever, uh, cantilever rather, the parts of the massive skyscraper over St. Peter's Church, which stood next door. So it was very daring. It was very controversial design. And a 914-foot monolith that seemed to hover weightless above the street. So give me a thumbs up if you can picture this building, right? So Lomashore said to this uh, engineering student, I gave her a lot of information and he said about her, now I said, you really have something on your professor because you can explain it all to your professor yourself. So engineering student calls him up, asks a question about the design, he explains everything and says, now you know. So later on that day, Lemeshore decided that his own students at Harvard would be interested in all this. So he begins to prepare a lecture about this engineering student's question. And he redid some of his original calculations using not only perpendicular wind forces, which by the way, were the only ones required by New York code, but also he factored in wind gusts hitting the tower at 45 degrees. His new calculations surprised him. The crosswinds actually increased the stress on the joints of the building by 40%. And this really worried him because at a meeting just two weeks prior, he had learned that his original plans that had called for welded joints had been modified without his knowledge. And instead of welds, they used bolts. And nobody thought that was going to be a big problem until they ran this new set of calculations. And again, the question about this story is, what would you have done? Lamashore quickly set up some meetings with colleagues and laid out all of his new calculations to get some other opinions. Hey, Jackie, great to see you, honey. Shabbat Shalom. Good to have you with us. And he schedules some tests to be done in Canada on scale models of this tower 
using the new wind forces and bolts instead of welds. Now, the results confirms his fears. The city core building was dangerously susceptible to high sustained winds. And here's the really scary thing. If it went, it would topple like a domino. It, do, it wouldn't just go straight down. It would go like a domino, no, taking out literally buildings of blocks of buildings. So it would take over some, those other ones would take over some, it would literally take out blocks of other buildings. So with hurricane season fast approaching, Lemeshore worked on new calculations and he finally looked at that a storm that would cause the tower to crumple would and fall would probably only occur once in 55 years and it most likely wouldn't even happen. So he weighs out his options. What would he do? He could keep quiet and probably everything would be fine or he could blow the whistle on himself and throw away his career and his reputation. What would your response be? Well, we'll come back to that story in a bit. But for now, let's turn our attention on a parable that Yeshua told in Matthew, in the book of Matthew. And this is something really important that we all know. Conversations with Jesus are dangerous. Conversations with Jesus are dangerous. You cannot remain the same at the end of them. The questions, challenges, and interruptions come so hard that we are left with our heads spinning, confused and confirmed at the same time. Let's, let's read that last sentence again. Confused and confirmed at the same time. And the reason I really wanted to word it like that is because even when we get hit with a challenge, even when Jesus really just pool we read something and our head starts spinning and we're confused and we get conflicted there's always a confirmation there isn't it and we can be confused and confirmed at the same time and in fact that's often the case with the words of Jesus hey Kate great to see you from Cali good to have you with us Shabbat Shalom so confused the words of Jesus confused and confirmed we are at the same time so the parable of two sons and four responses told by Yeshua was to religious extremists of his day, alongside of his own followers. And it's a story of words and of actions, which are very important, especially today. They're always important, but especially today. So if you want to follow along with me, if, if this is too small or you want to read it on your device, it's Matthew 21, 28 through 31a. This is Jesus talking. But give me your opinion. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. He answered, I don't want to. But later he changed his mind. Now, that's the Greek word there for changed his mind. It's a Greek word, metamolami. And I'm going to talk about what that means in a little bit. Uh, but put a pin in that. And went. So the son said, no, I don't want to. But later he changes his mind and he goes to work in the vineyard. Okay. The father went to his other son and said the same thing. This one answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two is what his father did what his father wanted so Yeshua is asking which of the two did what his father wanted now he tells this very simple story of a very common request from fathers to their sons right in Matthew's telling of the parable Yeshua invites his challengers and his followers to interact with him in the question which of the two did what his father wanted so it's a very simple question right which of the two did what his father wanted now for those of you who know what the answer is um you this won't be a surprise but verse 31b to 32 they answer the first they replied 
That's right, Yeshua said to them. I tell you that the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Now, these are social outcasts, right? For Yochanan, and that's speaking of John the Baptist, okay? So Jesus says, for John the Baptist came to you showing the path to righteousness, and you wouldn't trust him. The tax collectors and prostitutes trusted him, but you, even after you saw this, didn't change your minds later and trust him. So what Jesus is really saying here is that there's a disconnect with these religious zealots of his day, these this extremists, with what they say and what they do. And what he did was he used society's outcasts as an example of, I am happier with these people than with you. So the first son's refusal to do as his father asked is not only disobedience, but at the same time, it's really showing rebellion against his father's authority, especially in this culture, right? You don't backtalk your dad, okay? So this is not a cool thing to do, okay? But this marshal, again, this is about one main point, not all the little factors of the story, right? This marshal or this parable is not saying it's better to say no to God if that's what you really feel, at least you're not a liar. That's not the point of this parable, okay? He's not saying that it's good for the son to tell the father no. It's important to understand the wording given in Matthew's account. The word metamelamai, translated change one's mind, also can be seen as feeling regret or feeling remorse. So in other words, you say no, but then there's this kind of conviction of wrongdoing in which at that point, the son turns away from disobedience and does what the father asks. And we all know that that's the Hebrew concept and word teshuvah, right? You've heard me say this a bazillion times, right? Teshuvah is the Hebrew word for repentance and it's where you turn away from the thing that's separating you from God and turn back towards the Lord. This is this Greek concept in the same way. So the son says, not, nah, not going to do it. And then he thinks about it a little bit and he gets convicted and he turns away from that answer. No. And he turns towards doing and he does. He does it. So it's a connection to the remorse in the wrong uh, thing. Neither. Oh, Ryan saying neither. Hey, Terracotta. Yep. Terracotta. Good to see you. Great to have you with us. Um, so again, this is a really interesting thing that Yeshua is trying to do here, because if you would have to pick, you may pick neither in this parable, but Jesus is actually saying the first one, it, the choice is which one. So it's not a trick question. The choice is which one. So let's take a look at this. Be open to changing your minds. There are many paths that can lead you home. There, there are many paths that can lead you home. So here's the thing. When we say something and it's a no to good and we say no for whatever reason, and then we come, become convicted, just like the son in the story, of his lack of doing, we need to understand that we can always change our mind because there's many paths we can take to go home. So even if we didn't say yes here, we can say yes over here. It's never too late. It's actually a very common human response to say no to God. I've done it. You've done it. There's some pretty significant people that have also done it. Moshe, Jonah, Isaiah, and many throughout human history will tell you the story of how they said, nope, 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 first. They all said no, but then they changed to doing. Something changed in their heart to, from saying no to doing. So Yeshua, it's not like he was condoning saying no, but he was inviting all who have said no to change their minds and to do. 
And that's a really important thing that we need to realize. So we are either in the process of resisting truth or in the process of being changed by truth. Truth, truth is there. It's all around us. It's all up in our faces. Okay? We can try to ignore it and not look at it all we want. Truth is there. And we're either resisting it or we're in the process of being changed by it. And that is the reality of life. God is everywhere. And in him is that truth. Um, Jackie says, be open to change your mind. Hey, Beth, great to see you, honey. Great to have you with us. That's a tough saying for 2021, uh, Jim is saying, with everyone so stuck in their ways, right? Opinions, right? That, again, this is really relevant to where we are now, right, Jim? Uh, I want to print that saying out and give it to people I know who are politically conservative. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, Randell, great to have you with us. Shabbat Shalom. Good to see you. So the ultimate way is say yes and do the will of the Father. But if that doesn't happen, if you say no, good is also being open to metamolomai, which is a changing of your mind because of a conviction. It's not this sort of logic that changes your mind. It's a conviction. It's something that you feel, something that you know. You know what conviction feels like, right? We all know what conviction feels like. And we either shut it down and harden our hearts, or we say, teach me. Let me learn. Let me know. Let me feel this completely. And then out of that, there is a doing first. Um, so the first son in this mashal, Hebrew for parable, says no and then changes his mind and obeys. And the father moves to the second son in this story that Jesus tells, who agrees to go and even strengthens his affirmation with his father by referring to his father as sir. In the Greek, it's the word kyrios, meaning he to whom I belong. So the second son, the one that says yes, but doesn't go, he refers to his father as the one whom he belongs to. So he's acknowledging that position of the father in his life. He's looking at him in the face and he says, sir, I will go out. But then he does not go out and work in the, in the vineyard. His actions appeared obedient and sincere. But then he decides not to work in the vineyard, breaking his own word. And by the way... It's still a lie. I, I hate to tell you this, but when you speak something and you don't do it, now I understand that sometimes it's outside of your control and that's not a lie because you meant to do it. But when you speak something and you don't do it, that's a lie. Now, we don't know what this second son's intentions were in this story from the beginning. Maybe he also spoke and changed his mind. Or, in other words, maybe he wanted to do it, but then changed his mind. Or maybe he lied from the very beginning. But what Yeshua is saying here concerning this son is you say yes, but you do not do. It doesn't matter what your intentions were. And again, Yeshua is speaking not only to his own follower, followers, to these extremist religious rites that are following him around at this point and challenging him. He's saying, you say you believe doctrines, but without showing any devotion. And devotion to God is about our doing. So he's showing here the four responses. Two is what they said. One said yes, one said no. Two is what they did. One changed his mind and went. One did not go. So let me ask you this. Do you say no quickly? Maybe it's to just not have a confrontation. Maybe it's just because you want to be liked. Maybe it's just because you just want to get rid of the conversation. Do you say yes too quickly before you've really thought about it and then not do it? 
Or do you maybe say no too quickly and then change your mind and do it? What, which would you say is your normal kind of pattern in life? And hey, maybe you're really healthy and you think about it first. And then if it's a good thing that you feel like you're to do, you say yes and you do it. But in light of the story, in light of the parable, which ones do you think you lean more to? Um, Jim says, I feel like I say no in order to not raise ex expectations. Yeah, a lot of people do that, Jim. <laughs> Jackie says, ouch. Hey, Evangelina, good to see you. Great to have you with us tonight. Randell says, it appears we either allow truth to move us closer to freedom or further into bondage. That's so true, Randell. Jackie says, conviction is good if we are willing to open to what God wants for us. It can bring about unexpected changes that we ourselves could not foresee. Absolutely. It's why I really have an open heart, even when it's uncomfortable. My saying to myself now is, um, and I just say it in my own head, and I've really never shared this with anyone. You guys, it's just going to be us that we talk about this. But when something hits me that really convicts me and it makes me very uncomfortable and I don't like it at all, and right away I say, okay, show me. <laughs> because I know there's a lesson in it. I know that there's a truth that, that I need to, to hear. So instead of arguing in my own mind about why this isn't for me, why I don't have to look at this right now, I have kind of like made a habit, habit of saying, okay, show me. And even when it comes from a really unlikely place, I still say that. I want God to show me the thing in it. Proverbs 12, 19 says, Truthful words will stand forever, lying speech but a moment. This is one of my favorite verses, really. And it's just a, a personal comfort for me. I love this. Truthful words will stand forever. So when words of truth are spoken... They live forever. But lying speech just lives for a moment. And even with the internet, okay, still it is not eternal. It does not live on. Truth lives on and it's eternal. A lie does not. It lives for a moment. And the reason why God says it's a moment is because in the scope of things, it is for a moment. Okay, even if it's for a hundred years, it's still for a moment in eternity, right? Uh, John says, uh, God never gives me more than I can handle. I just wish that he would not trust me so much. That's funny, John. <laughs> That's good. Randell says, I tend to say yes slowly, knowing he knows best. Slowly is really a healthy way to enter into things when we feel like we're being challenged. Because, of course, we know we should let our yes be yes. Ryan says, I used to say yes too quickly. For sure, it was a real problem, even within the family. Yes, absolutely. Because sometimes we just want to be helpful, right? And then we kind of realize, well, I'm not being helpful because if I can't really give this with love and grace, and it's more like I'm just like kind of grinding through it, it's not really a sacred gift anyway, is it? So the way that we give a gift is as important as the gift that we give, really. Sometimes we outright lie with no intentions of doing what we said. And normally we do that when we just really don't like the drama of the confrontation. So we just outright lie first. But again, this is a thing. Ask yourself, why do we say yes so quickly? Because there's a lesson to be learned in that. And sometimes we want to do it, but then we don't do it. But Yeshua was saying here, I know your heart because of what you do, not what you say. Now again, we're, none of us are perfect. We all fall short. We all mean to do things. And then somehow maybe we forget or we just, we just flake out on it or we don't. We don't do it. But what Yeshua is saying here is what matters is not what you say. What matters is what you do. You knew the right answer, but you don't do it. And again, remember, he's not only talking to his followers, he's talking to, uh, to these extremist religious right, okay? Judging, 
what's what they believe, not what they do, not taking care of the marginalized, which is why he uses the prostitutes and the tax collectors here, because again, he's doing what he does, right? Being Talmudim of Yeshua is not about what we believe. Again, Talmudim is the Hebrew word for disciples. Being Talmudim of Yeshua is not about what we believe or say we believe. It's about doing the will of God. So let's circle back to the city corp tower. What happens? Well, after much soul search searching, Bill LeMessure writes, Thank you, dear Lord, for making this problem so sharply defined that there's no choice to make. If there was a structural problem, he had no choice but to blow the whistle on himself. And so, on July 31st, 1978, Lemesure met with his partner. The next day, August 1st, they met with some lawyers and some other engineers and architects. And on August 2nd, they flew to New York and met with Citicorp to break the news about their tower. What do you think that meeting was like? Okay. But the next morning, they laid out a plan to weld metal patches over every single bolted joint in the skyscraper. The plan was approved, and with potential hurricanes developing in the Atlantic that fall, they began lining up the welders and the construction crews to pull off this mammoth emergency repair. They worked seven days a week, round the clock from August through September, and finished the project in October. And when they were done, the City Corp Tower was one of the safest structures ever built. And looking back on the summer of 1978, when all this happened, Lama Shore reminds his architecture students, and I'm quoting, you have a social obligation. In return for getting a license and being regarded with respect, you're supposed to be self-sacrificing and look beyond the interest of yourself and your client to society as a whole. It's what you do that counts. <laughs> what a great real life parable, right? Real life story. It's what you do that counts. It's been estimated since this happened that if that tower in some of the more recent hurricanes had been hit by the winds that later came without those welds, that it could have potentially killed 200,000 people. Because again, the way that they projected that tower would have fell was the dominoes. It would have hit a building, that hit a building, that hit a building, that hit a building. And they said it would have sprawled potentially all the way to Central Park. That's a crazy thing. And all this got started by one engineering student calling up the engineer, La Mesure, and asking him, and him just finding out that the welding was changed, that the bolts were changed, and doing some new numbers, and taking responsibility. It's a crazy story, a true, real-life story. Jim says, can we send that quote to everyone in the world? <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Looking outside the interest of self, tell America that. Yeah, absolutely, Erin. And again, this is why I think this is so, uh, so, oh, uh, Beth is putting Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Absolutely. And we should all read that. And this is what we've gotten so far away from, right? Taking responsibility now. It's so important. And even when somebody gets called out on something that they did that's horrible, it's almost like instead of saying like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. That was really wrong. They just are like on to the next thing, like it never even happens. And again, it's what you do that counts, this engineer says. This is what Jesus taught in, in the parable. It's what you do that counts. Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way. Again, one of my favorite writers. There is no shortage of people who say believe or stand for all the right things. There have always been plenty of those in the world. What God is short of are people who will go where God calls them and do what God gives them to do. Amen. And again, it's, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. 
we see a lot of talk in these days. Talk with caring about important issues. But then do we see the doing? And often people either do nothing or they do the wrong thing. And in a society that is filled with words, 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 I don't know about you, but I am so sick of listening to the BS. People just talk and talk and talk and talk. We really need to focus on the actions. And that really is the basis of our trust. We need to say yes to good to good, and then we need to do it. And again, I'm not suggesting that every good work is yours, because this parable is about the father that asks. So it's more that when you feel that compulsion from God and he's saying, hey, you know what, this is your good work. We need to say yes and do. We need to make sure those with whom we make alliances with say yes and do as well. And when we say yes and do, it's really sending a powerful message in the world that love is still here and people still care. And that's important. We need to build trust. That is important. In closing, I just want to give you a really very real story and <clears throat> but it's the power of this it's the power of saying yes and doing um so there's a in in election time and again i live in an area called seminole heights and um tampa florida and um there and it was election time and there was a woman <clears throat> and she was running for council and she was riding around my area, and apparently she was a longtime Seminole Heights uh, resident, and a lot of the people knew her and really liked her, and there was a lot of people running for council, and a lot of them said things that I would want to hear, that I aligned myself with, right? But I didn't really know any of them, and all of them were new. And there was this woman who was running for council, and I was walking the dog, <coughs> and she put her sign in my neighbor's yard. She asked them, and they said, yeah, and she was going to houses and handing out brochures about what she wanted to do and what was important to her, and she was asking them if they could put a, if she could put a sign in their front yard. This is Florida. They still do that here, right? And I'm watching her. I'm kind of walking behind her, and in Hillsborough County, where I live, you're allowed to have chickens in your yard. And a lot of people, especially nowadays, really depend on them. They eat their eggs and they eat the chickens. And it's very important. It's people's food. And there was a UPS driver um, that was dropping off something. And when he left, he didn't close the gate all, all the way. And he walked in and I saw it and dropped the, the package off. And then he walked out and he did not close the gate all the way. And this council, this woman running for council saw it. And he got in his truck and ran away. And she dropped all of her things and ran to the gate to close it because the chickens were running like 20 of them to the open gate. And she dropped everything and she ran to close the gate. And she closed the gate. And then she looks and the UPS driver is parked two doors down and gets out of the truck. So she makes a beeline for him and she gives him a piece of her mind. And she's pointing to the gate and she's telling them to be careful. And these are people, this is people's food. This is a lot of money. You have to pay attention. Like she's, she's giving them the business, right? And then she walks all the way back and picks up her, her posters and, and her um, brochures. Now, you know who I voted for? <laughs> I voted for her because here's the deal. She does, she doesn't just say it. She does it. She dropped all the stuff that she paid her money for, her posters, her brochures, in order to save those chickens for somebody that never saw her do it. She didn't take credit for that. No one even knew she did it. And then she wanted to straighten out the UPS driver for not being more careful. Now, that's a person that I feel good about voting for, right? And also, at the same time, in this horrible election time, it gave me hope that people still care. Even when no one is watching, they still care. And that's what saying yes and doing good in the world does. It gives people hope again, which is what we so need. Phoebe says yes.
<laughs> save the birds, right? This is what we so need. So, as we read this scripture in Philippians, so important, and as we think about this and maybe read this parable again, let's really be convicted in our own hearts as people that love God. When God shows us good to do in the world, let us say yes and let us do good. So I love you all. Shabbat Shalom. I will see you next week. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are members in the Sabbath uh, Collective Members Group, if you want to talk about anything special, I kind of put that post out there. Let me know if you want to talk about anything special. Um, Alexandra made a, comp, made a suggestion. Aaron made a suggestion. We're going to talk about his suggestion this coming Friday. So let me hear your heart on what you're interested in talking about, okay? Shabbat Shalom. Love you all.